SureDog.com here with one of the founders of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, Mr. Art Davey. I guess the first thing I'd like to talk about is, based on the fact that for most people your story starts with meeting Hori and Gracie, what was your background before all that? You were in advertising, but what was your upbringing like? I actually was a, a poor amateur boxer. And a friend brought a wrestler over to me back in 65 on the beach out in Hampton Bays, Long Island. And I got humbled by ta being taken down. And he put a hold on me, and I thought, we're about the same size. I couldn't land up. We were just, you know, sparring, and it went south on me. And I never forgot that. And l later on, I ended up in the Marine Corps. I enlisted as opposed to waiting for the draft. And it was always a popular topic of conversation among Marines. If you put a boxer together with a wrestler, who would win? Then along in the 70s, I'm in the advertising business in California, and um, we see Muhammad Ali matched up against Antonio Inoki. We see uh, Chuck Wepner matched up against Andre the Giant. So this was an ongoing discussion. And Gene LaBelle had met Milo Savage in a famous, uh, you know, mixed martial arts. I think it's fair to call it a mixed martial it's arts fair to fight, call it. especially by the standards of the 60s. Exactly. Although I got to give credit to, uh, to Howard Rosenberg, an LA journalist, who I believe was the first one to ever actually use that term. Because we, we didn't start using it. It was, I believe, Rosenberg in an LA Times article. So by the time that I'm in an ad agency and I'm sitting down with the boss's client and they asked me, they said, well, uh, you're supposedly a big idea guy in the agency. What kinds of things do you think you could come up with? And I, made a, I came up back with a list of opportunities that they could get behind, sponsorship, et cetera. And one of them was the seminal idea for the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And as a result of all this research for this beer client, I had met Hori and Gracie. I discovered an article in the September 1989 issue of Playboy, and it was B.A.D., bad. So I called up the Gracie Academy, and I think I got, um, I got Horian's wife. And uh, we talked, and she took down some information. She told Horian about me, and I, he, he looked at it and thought, who's this? I called up a week or two later. And finally, Horian and I got on the phone. He said, well, come on out and take a look. He says, you know, we, we're, we're doing these things with jujits. I said, okay. I came out there during the week, and we sat down to talk, and, and I, Horian wasn't really paying attention to me. I could see he was looking at me and sort of listening, but I got the feeling I was the 18th guy who had sat down with him and said, gee, have you ever thought about doing some sort of a, you know, uh, an, he said, well, we have the Gracie Challenge. You read about it in the article. He said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you come back with some sweats? He said, let me give you a private. He said, I think you'd get a big kick out of this. I came back a day or two later, I think in the afternoon or the early evening, and we rolled. I was fascinated. Who's got a class on the same night right before me is film director and screenwriter John Milius. Now, I recognize Milius. I knew who he was. One night, I came back with a sketch and it was called War of the Worlds. And I said to John, would you be involved in this if Horian and I could do something? And he said, I'll do anything for Horian. He said, you can attach my name. He said, it'd be, be a pleasure. But I really couldn't get Horian interested. I was, like I said, the 18th guy who talked to him about doing something. And every time I talked to him about it, I could see it went in one ear and out the other. One of the ways that people phrase UFC 1 is that it was a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu infomercial. So I think a lot of people would find it surprising that it took this level of coaxing out of it really did. It really did. And what, what it really came down to was that I had no more credibility than Pat Strong or a number of other good people would come to him and said, I got an idea. We'll do a video, put your brother Hickson on the beach with a kickboxer, and we'll get it into Blockbuster. What I did that changed the entire complexion of our relationship is I said to him, you've got this inaction tape and you're getting ready to introduce the basics of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. How do you intend to market it? And I could see it was a little vague as I was going to go about it, maybe do an ad in black belt inside karate, inside kung fu. I said, you have a database. He said, what's that? I said, well, you have a list of people you've ever... Oh, so I got 24,000 names. My eyes got real big because I was working at the time as the director of client services for a direct mail marketing company. And I said to him, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll do a free campaign for you. You just print it. But you do exactly what I tell you to do, and we're going to mail to this list. I talked him into it. We did the mailing. He brought in $150,000. And it was like, whoa. Then I came back in his office and I sat down and I rubbed my hands. I said, okay, now let me show you what we're going to do. 
Now I had his attention. I said, it's pay-per-view. He said, well, how are we going to do that? I said, I'll show you. I said, and it's not the Gracie Challenge. It's a tournament. It's an eight-man single elimination tournament. He said, well, how does that work? I said, well, we're going to have eight guys come in. I said, you're going to have one guy from jiu-jitsu. I said, it'll be one of the eight. So I talked to him, and we formed a company up in Colorado. I'd already done the research and found out that you could do an LLC in Colorado. They were doing it for gas and oil drilling. I drove up there. I got us an attorney. I got us an accountant. I got us a bank. And I formed Wild Promotions. Then I came back, and I wrote this business plan, 65 pages. And we brought all of our family and friends into the back of the academy one night. And I had been in touch with Lou DiBella at HBO. I had been in touch with Jock McLean at Showtime. Both of them had turned me down. But I had found Semaphore Entertainment that was in the business of doing pay-per-view one-shots. They had a very bright guy who was in charge of acquisitions. He was a, a graduate of Berkeley. He had been involved in helping to start the, start, the uh, Catch a Rising Star comedy nightclubs. A very bright guy by the name of Campbell McLaren. I sent Campbell uh, a fax. In those days, it was not emails. I sent him a fax, and I gave him a two-page outline of the War of the Worlds concept. He called me back, and he said, we're sending you tickets. To, oh, I want to bring you to New York. I want you to pitch this to Bob Myrowitz. Sounds fantastic. So we literally went in front of family and friends, and we raised a quarter of a million dollars. In fact, Campbell flew in for that meeting and explained to everybody that my company's putting $450,000 into this first show. Talk to me about the budget of the first UFC. Do you remember the exact figure? What was the process like? The rough budget for that first show, UFC 1, November 12th, 1993, was about $750,000. About a quarter of a million dollars was for the event itself, uh, what took place inside the octagon, the talent, etc., the travel, all the associated costs there. A third was uh, devoted to the television production. We had six cameras, including a Chapman Crane. And a third was marketing, in terms of incentivizing the public to reach out and buy the, and become a subscriber and buy the pay-per-view, and incentivizing the cable companies to promote it in lieu of whatever boxing or wrestling show was there that month. And I figured out early on that the capital that was funding the UFC through Semaphore was from Bertelsmann's music group, BMG, at that time the largest private entertainment corporation on the planet Earth. In fact, David Isaacs, who was an SEG employee, had been with Bertelsmann's and was there in effect to watch how their money was being spent. And it was Bertelsmann's money that had funded the UFC. They came to show two with Bob because on the success of the first show, almost 90,000 subscribers, uh, it was a big hit. But Bob and I, uh, there was a certain, you know, adversarial relationship based on money. It was always us arguing about, well, what did that really cost? Bob, I need to see the invoices on that. Uh, don't worry, uh, Stephen Loeb, our accountant, will get them. And then I'd be on Loeb the next week bugging him. What kind of things did they quibble about the lawyers at that point in time? Money. It was to be a joint venture. We were split 50-50. And it was also about how, you know, how is this going to be accounted for? You know, at what point were profits to be declared? Uh, would I be able to see every invoice, uh, et cetera, et cetera? And in the beginning, we were going to continue to put up the purse. The night of the UFC, November 12, 1993, I still hadn't signed the agreement as managing member for WOW Promotions. And I realized at that point in the hotel room that we couldn't do the show that night until I signed. I had Bob Marowitz on the phone in New York, his brother David on another phone. Campbell McLaren was on a conference call from downstairs, and my attorney, Don Moss, was on the call. It was a huge conference call. And meantime, John Milius' son, Ethan, is putting the studs in my tuxedo and trying to get me dressed in time for the show, and I'm realizing they can't do this show unless I sign. And at that moment, I pulled my rabbit out of the hat. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll sign tonight, but from now on, you guys put up the purse. Oh, Bob Meyer would say, you're a, you're, you're a gangster, you're a criminal, you're a... But he signed. We had to do the show that night, and that's how the first UFC came to be.